Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm really looking forward to this next hour. We get to meet with a peacemaking pioneer, the Yoda of mediation, um, <laughs> and just somebody that I have really admired and um, and I think has, what's the right word, has has created the path that has helped a lot of us to figure this out, right? Has really shown us um, how to resolve disputes in a way that that really honors the other person. And so, Ken, I think I've been studying at your feet, so to speak, for the last couple of decades and just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. I really appreciate everything that you have done for this field and thank you for spending the next hour with us. So we get to talk about his upcoming book. Um, I was lucky enough a month or so ago to be able to see the table of contents and you showed me some of the thoughts that were coming in your book. And um, and as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, everybody has to hear about this. This is going to be very exciting. So thank you for agreeing to do a book club so we can discuss it a little bit more and then share some of these ideas with our mediate.com members. Um, so let's see, I have a lot of questions about the book, but before I dive in, Ken, do you wanna tell us just a little bit about, about what was your purpose? What was your inspiration for this? Uh, well, first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me. It's a little unusual to be speaking about a book that nobody, in a book club that nobody <laughs> has been able to read because it isn't quite out yet. Um, but uh, yesterday I finished the index and it will be out in a matter of weeks now. Yes. So there's that excitement of, of, that I can only imagine about giving birth. Um, and um, the question of uh, what the book actually uh, what led to it, why I wrote it, uh, has been something that I've been thinking about for some time. Um, and uh, I've written a number of books in conflict resolution. My total now is about 20. This would be, I think, number 20. Um, and in each case, I have followed a kind of path of uh, trying to explore what this field actually contains, what's within it, um, what are the limits, what are the promises. So the subtitle of the book that I wrote, Mediating Dangerously, is The Frontiers of Conflict Resolution. And there are two frontiers. There's an inner frontier in each of us which is the place where our knowledge and understanding and skill comes, uh, begins to dissipate um, and comes to a halt. And there's the external frontier of um, how this work impacts the world in which we live. So uh, we are now living in a world in which there, is, there are wars taking place in Gaza, in Ukraine, um, in which I think we can fairly say that people are dying for lack of the skills that we represent, for lack of conflict resolution and uh, a willingness to participate in it. Um, sorry? Yeah. So now, um, uh, at the end of writing a book, there are always a series of topics that just don't fit. Um, they, they are perhaps, um, uh, I wasn't ready yet to tackle them uh, because it's progressive and we understand some things which enable us to understand the next thing, which enables us to understand the next thing. Um, and so the, these began to accumulate um, uh, and they corresponded to a set of interests that I have had for a long time, um, interests in mathematics uh, and in physics, uh, interests in literature, uh, interests in spirituality and mediation, meditation and mediation and mindfulness, um, uh, in politics, 
and the nature of political conflicts um, in um, how we deal with death and dying, um, how we handle trauma um, and recovery. Um, and fundamental, I think, to all of this is, what is this really about? And it has always felt to me as though we have you know, a, a kind of a small little hand on a gigantic thing um, that we know next to nothing about. And so we are very happy in our practices. Um, we are successful in helping people figure out how to understand something about the nature of the issues that they're facing. But beyond this is something that I think for the most part, we haven't we had barely touched. And so uh, I've also gone back quite a bit to Mary Parker Follett, who I don't know how many of you have heard of Mary Parker Follett, but she wrote in the 1910s and 20s, and she is really the, found, the founder of modern mediation. Mediation, of course, is as ancient as uh, conflict, which means um, on some principle, on some level, it goes back to the beginning of the universe. Um, in the Big Bang was created um, positive, negative, and neutral. Uh, what was created was space, meaning here and there and in between. What was created was time, which meant before and after and now. And that principle of now and the principle of here, and the principle of not exactly neutral, because we need to uh, shift that in a slightly different direction, I think. Um, but that principle of unification, um, uh, the unifying principle is one which is a part of the en entire universe. So what is that about? And how do we learn from some of these deeper aspects of conflict that we haven't paid much attention to. And so um, I decided that I really kind of need to um, look at a, on a larger scale uh, and at the same time figure out how do I translate what I learn on a larger scale down into a uh, something that is useful, that isn't just about math or physics or literature or any of those subjects that I address and have chapters on in the new book, but is practical on some level. And so the title of the book is The Magic in Mediation, colon, A Search for Symmetries, Metaphors, and Scale-Free Practices. And what that means is that um, conflict is on, a, and if you think of it scientifically, it is fractally organized. And the definition of a fractal in science is something that is self-similar on all scales. So you can scale up and scale down with ease um, once you've established a kind of scale-free um, uh, uh, um, part of whatever it is that you're looking at or aspect of whatever it is that you're looking at. So the question really becomes, um, how do we scale down and how do we scale up? And what is it that we look at in order to be able to do that? And here, what was important was to um, use the idea of metaphor um, not only because of the fact that it is um, kind of suitably imprecise, meaning that if you try to be too precise about something that isn't itself precise, um, you will fix it in a way that is um, that destroys the information that's contained within it. So what we want to do is to leave room for um, uh, change for diversity, 
uh, of perspective for um, different messages to flow from whatever it is that is taking place. And indeed, this is a description, I believe, of what we do in mediation on a day-to-day -day basis, which is we don't, what the law says is basically um, the principles are the same for Adolf Hitler and your, you know, sort of your, your grandmother. Um, it doesn't matter who the person is. Uh, there is a fixed quality to the principles um, and all we need to know are what are the facts and what are the consequences of those facts in relationship to legal ideas. And we can kind of treat that as an algorithm that turn, you know, or a, a kind of uh, machine that churns out an answer. Um, but conflict resolution is different. Um, so if our concern is only with the facts, the facts shouldn't change. Uh, if our concern is only with the legal principles, the legal principles shouldn't change. But people change every second. Their emotions change um, all the time. Their understanding changes. Their attitudes change. And so what we therefore need to uh, kind of recognize is that none of us is going to mediate in exactly the same way. Um, and I can't mediate the way that Claire does and Claire can't mediate the way that I do. It's just what we bring simply on the basis of who we are um, is already such a powerful ingredient in what happens in any conflict conversation that um, the, the whole thing will be different. What people say will be different just because of who it is, who they're speaking to. It's a little bit like the way we were talking about before in terms of the book that you read when you're a teenager and the book that you read when you're um, now in your 40s or 50s, or in my case, 80s. So now, what is exactly does this lead to? And I think that what it leads to is something absolutely gorgeous. Um, and that is a far more uh, nuanced understanding of how conflict resolution creates outcomes that are unimaginable before the conversation began. And this is what I mean by magic. So magic isn't sleight of hand, uh, it isn't trickery. Um, it is the transformational potential that nobody could see because the conversation hadn't happened yet that emerges as a result of what uh, a, a series of things that we either are or do. So there are several ways in which magic happens in mediation. And by magic, I simply mean the moment when people become unstuck. So um, as long as our concern is simply with settlement, that is with determining what the facts are, what the issues are and trying to reach a compromise, which is not a bad thing. It's actually quite a beautiful thing. Um, that is powerful and important and saves people's lives. But there's something that is beyond that. And that is to use Claire's words, rising above, uh, that is transcendence. Transformation first, transcendence second, meaning changing the form of the conflict, of the conversation, allowing us to gain insight into what it is that is actually taking place, and then realizing that we do not need to be stuck there. Um, this is a fundamentally a spiritual reality about conflict resolution. Um, so how do we combine that spiritual reality with this idea about mathematics? Well, 
Um, let's just take it at a very simple level. In the first place, math is just abstraction of quantity, uh, of shape, of form, uh, of structure, um, of process. And so if we think about mathematics, we can, for example, um, look at um, how it is that, um, well, now I'm going to, uh, actually, let me stay away from that because this is going to get us a little bit further, deeper than into something that you might not be interested in. I'll come back to it later if you'd like to. Let me take a just a, a, a simpler example, maybe from physics, which is, um, uh, or the, we can use the math as well, which is uh, about magnetism. Um, we have positive and negative. And so the entire earth is a magnetic entity in which there's a North Pole and a South Pole. Um, corresponding as metaphor to the parties in dispute resolution. Very simple idea. So now we can see that um, the strength of their polarity decreases as people uh, reach the, the equator. That is the middle. And so we think of mediation as being the middle way, and like in Buddhism, there's a middle way. Um, and what the equator represents is a kind of compromise, that is a place where the strength and power of one um, uh, become kind of diminished and the strength and power of the other get diminished so that they are able to reach each other without canceling or forcing each other apart. But there's a second place where polarity meets and that is at the pole itself. And the pole itself as a metaphor represents a line of what people care about most deeply, most passionately. And here we are not compromising. What we are instead doing is finding the absolute center um, of people's passion and discovering that there is a place where they can meet along that line of polarity, where they are in fact one. Now that's pretty profound. And now the question becomes, what do we do with that? How do we turn that into technique? And so there's a chapter in the book, which is called The Magic and Mediation, how to find, feed and foment it. And, um, it's about how to find those places of unity in the midst of opposition and to combine them and see that it's not a question of choosing unity over opposition, but of seeking their creative synthesis. So um, I think we all know because we are all of an age where we have been in multiple relationships and had you know thousands and thousands of conflicts within those relationships over thinking that we were right and the other person thinking that they were right but if we look back on those from a conflict resolution perspective we can see that there is a higher form of right which is the right of listening to each other valuing what the other person believes is right and seeking ways of incorporating that alternative form of what is right into what we believe is right, finding in fact that there is a better solution than either the one that I proposed or the one that the other person proposed. And that is the combination of those two. What does that consist of? We don't know until we start talking. Uh, and yet we can see that there is magic um, in that kind of conversation. So um, the 
Uh, I'm giving a long answer to your question, Claire. <laughs> um, but here's really the reason why I wanted to write this book. I wanted to see if I could explore um, some areas that we haven't ever really explored. Uh, in my experience, I've read a great deal about this and practiced it for 43 years. Um, and I haven't read anything really that looks at the relationship between literature and conflict resolution that really strikes me as deep and profound and valid, um, as deep and profound and valid as literature is for each of us, as poetry is, as drama is. But isn't this, isn't every mediation a kind of drama? Isn't there plot? Isn't there character? Um, uh, aren't there um, um, uh, issues that we are facing um, that out of the uh, kind of reading of literature, we learn something about ourselves, about the other. Um, we increase our capacity for empathy and compassion. Um, so how does that happen? What is it exactly that literature does? Um, another um, kind of more profound example from my point of view is about political conflicts. And I've written about this in a couple of other books. One is called Politics, Dialogue, and the Evolution of Democracy. Um, but this is about, and the last one is politics, I'm sorry, mediation in a time of crisis. Uh, and much of that was really printed uh, or uh, revealed for the first time in mediate.com, for which I am deeply grateful. Um, and Claire and I have, you know, sort of um, um, had these opportunities to uh, really kind of uh, explore some of this literature uh, through the pages of, or the, the electronic pages of mediate.com. So, but the question is then, what exactly would an interest-based state look like? What would it mean to shift from power to rights to interests at the level of political government? How, how would that get constituted? Um, and here, I think we can see that there are three simple fundamental definitions that we can give of uh, politics from an interest-based perspective. What is an interest-based definition of politics? Here's one. Politics is a social problem solving process. Well, that sounds easy, um, but isn't that just the case? It's a social problem solving process. And don't we know something about social problem solving processes? as a result of public uh, dialogue, uh, as a result of public policy mediations, environmental mediations, community mediations, et cetera? And the answer is yes, I think that we do. Um, but we also can learn from uh, what happens at the level of um, uh, uh, kind of the, the the style of dialogue that looks not only at empathy building, but at uh, searching for solutions. Um, second, um, politics is a large group, multi-stakeholder consensus building process. Okay, once again, we have some experience dealing with large group, multi-stakeholder consensus building processes. This is what many of us have actually concentrated, not many of us, a few of us have concentrated our practices in uh, working with large communities, with multiple stakeholders. Every environmental mediation is a large group, multi-stakeholder consensus building process. What have we learned from those processes that might be applicable to political decision-making? And the answer is a great deal that would actually make it much, much more um, uh, constructive and collaborative for us to approach problem solving from that perspective. Finally, number three, politics is a conflict resolution process. 
Well, once again, isn't that interesting? But isn't that the case? We talk about it as the art of compromise, but really it's the art of conflict resolution in which compromise is one technique, one methodology. But there are other methodologies we might be able to bring into the political process. And when we think about it in that way, we can see a way forward for us as a profession in terms of the growth of our entire project, uh, a massive expansion into an arena in which we are called forth. Um, we are called forth by Gaza. We are called forth by Ukraine. We are called forth by Sudan. And we have not responded and I think we have not responded, at least we have not been able to respond in a way, in a professional way. We've responded individually as, in, as people by giving donations or by offering assistance or one thing or another. But we haven't brought the power of our um, professional work to bear on problem solving at this level. And I think for very good reason, it's easy to get trapped. But if we can figure out where we get trapped, how we get trapped, why we get trapped, we can then discover that there are ways of getting untrapped. And one of those is by understanding what it is that politics is actually trying to do and how it intersects with our work. Um, the, uh, the, the last part of this that I want to mention, and I'm going to let Claire say something, <laughs> um, is about the scale-free part of this. Um, uh, in, uh, there, there's a wonderful man, his name is Martin Rees. He's the um, astronomer royal for Great Britain. Um, and he says there are three fundamental problems in physics. The very small, the very large, and the very complex. And I think it's the same in conflict resolution. We have the very small, teeny tiny, little you know, conflicts that take place in every family, in every uh, relationship, and how we handle them. Micro resolutions, if you will, not just micro aggressions, but micro resolutions. Um, and number two, we have the very, very large, which is this massive stuff. We are facing existential crises in connection with global warming, in connection with pandemics, in connection with war and nuclear proliferation, uh, in connection with how we treat one another as human beings, which is what the lot of the political battles that are taking place today are actually about. Um, who is it who has a right to have a bathroom? Who is it who has a right to read whatever it is that they want? Um, and who doesn't, etc. cetera. So um, what is this really about? And I think that what it is about is the perception that there isn't going to be enough to go around maybe because of climate change, but there's going to be some kind of scarcity. And what do we do in the face of scarcity? We have two options, me first and the hell with you, or we're all in this together. And it doesn't matter whose end of the boat is sinking. We are going down together or we're going to survive together. Is this gonna be difficult? Absolutely, next to impossible. And yet what we are missing in terms of the existential nature of this crisis is the realization that a technology exists that will allow us to make that process work more effectively, the collaborative process work more effectively. And that is the, the technology that we practice. So, um, there's a wonderful statement that I quote by Hannah Arendt. There's a chapter on the war in Ukraine in the book, and all wars. 
So it's not just, it's partly about Ukraine, but it really it's about war and what we do in relation to war. And what Hannah Arendt says is that the cause of war isn't really brutality and it isn't really political stupidity and all of these various things. She says the cause, the ultimate cause of war is the absence of any technology for being able to resolve people's differences short of war. But that absence that she describes is no longer so real because we have spent 40, 50 years now building it, strengthening it, extending it, projecting it, making it easy to, um, or I should say, adapting it to technology. And this is Colin's major contribution to what it is that we are seeing in the world today. Um, and uh, it is a really significant contribution uh, because what we need to be able to do is to figure out how to spread this uh, around the world. Uh, last week, uh, I spoke about uh, the uh, war in Gaza three times. Uh, this week, not just not last week, this week, so far this week, three times. Um, uh, once in Ireland, um, once in India, uh, once really on YouTube spread around the world uh, with people participating from um, maybe 15, 20 different countries by virtue of Zoom. Um, and because of Zoom, we have this capacity to meet today uh, to talk a little bit about these issues. So the technology that we have is one that is frightening uh, to people because it has uh, within it uh, the capacity to um, really um, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, if I can put it slightly in, in a different way, um, it, it, our project is not fundamentally, I think, making technology safe for people, but making people safe for technology. Um, because it is primarily people who, in the first place, create technology, but in the second place, distort it, use it uh, for, you know, so uh, we discover the atom, which is quite extraordinary, and then bomb people with it. Um, I'm reading, I'm just finishing now a book by a man, a brilliant book by a man whose name is Benjamin Labatut, uh, who is Ar an Argentinian writer, and he's written about um, science, but in a novelistic way. Uh, and his latest book uh, is called Maniac, which is the title of the name of the computer created by John von Neumann, the greatest, probably the one of the top five mathematicians of the 20th century. And here's what von Neumann says. Uh, Technology is a human excretion and should not be considered as something other. It is a part of us, just like the web is part of the spider. The ever accelerating progress of technology gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity, a tipping point in the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them cannot continue. Progress will become incomprehensibly rapid and complicated. This was written in the 1950s. It is not the particularly perversive destructiveness of one specific invention that creates danger. The danger is intrinsic. For progress, there is no cure. Um, but what technology represents is a form of magic. Um, and there's a wonderful, um, uh, I've forgotten which, who, who it was who said this, one of the science fiction writers, maybe it was Ray Bradbury, um, who said there is no dis difference between um, a sufficiently advanced technology and magic. It always looks magical. And this is true of conflict resolution as well. It looks magical because we do not yet understand it, because it is a little beyond us, um, because it tests us. Um, 
uh, it offers us opportunities uh, to express ourselves in and through it. But if we haven't figured out who we are, if we haven't taken care of our own intentions, um, we will use it for purposes which are destructive, self-destructive only in, on an increasingly massive scale. Um, so uh, the book was written in an effort to try to figure out how to pull these things together. And the last part, the last chapter is about death and dying. And um, what it's really about is um, the um, uh, importance of the um, uh, of our coming to terms with the idea of death and dying in order to be able to mediate even small scale disputes, because there's a little death in every conflict, something just died. It can be tiny, but there's a little death in it. And therefore there's grieving. What do we know about grief? And the answer I would say is more than we think. And number two, not enough, not nearly enough. So what can we do as a result? We can bring our skills into, um, circumstances in which people are dealing with loss, with trauma. Uh, I think many of you know that I helped to start an organization called Mediators Beyond Borders. And we've done a lot of work in Rwanda with Hutus and Tutsis. And what we realized when we first began this work was everybody in Rwanda has been traumatized, everybody. And every new conflict re-triggers the trauma so what we did was we brought in trauma professionals and linked them with conflict resolution professionals and created something called trauma-informed mediation. And isn't every conflict a trauma? Doesn't everybody feel traumatized who's gone through it, if only on a small scale? And what is trauma really? Um, it isn't just the injury, uh, it's how we handle the injury. It's our capacity for resilience, for recovery. It's how long it takes us to say, I'm sorry, after we've done something um, that is damaging or hurtful to someone we love. And for everybody, there's a different time frame. but how do we reduce that time frame? So these are, um, this is a long, long answer. Um, I haven't really had it been asked it before, so I haven't really had a chance to think about it in a simple way. Um, but the uh, I would say it, the book is an exploration of all of these areas and the ways that they interconnect through the ability to scale up and scale down through metaphor, through uh, symmetries, which I haven't really described. Uh, a symmetry in physics is anything that remains the same once you change something else. So uh, you can take a circle, which has infinite symmetry, and rotate it one degree, it looks the same, but you can't do that with a square. So a square has a smaller degree of symmetry, but it looks the same if you rotate it by 90 degrees. Um, it also looks the same if you flip it. It has mirror symmetry, rotational symmetry, and there are a variety of symmetries in conflict resolution that match these symmetries. Um, you can take the parties in conflict resolution and essentially switch them and give them the other side's issues and that the conflict will look near, very nearly the same. So um, there was a a uh, woman mathematician um, who wrote in the early 20th century, um, uh, whose name is Emmy Noether, uh, who wrote a very famous mathematical theorem, um, which said that every symmetry reflects 
a law of conservation. For everything that is symmetrical, something is conserved. And so the law of conservation of energy flows out of the symmetry. And for every, uh, 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 for, for every symmetry, there is a law of conservation and vice versa. So we can say that we can ask the question then, based on this understanding from physics, what is conserved um, if we alter the symmetries of what people are um, presenting in their conflicts? And here again, it's this is I don't pretend to come up with the answers to any of these things. They're my answers, but there are an, an infinite number of answers that are possible as each of us begins to look into these issues and try and address them. So I'll try and stop there and, and give you a chance to maybe ask a different question or for other people to jump in. Um, and I'm hoping that if this sounds interesting to you, when the book is actually out, uh, maybe you will want to take a look at it and we could talk again and see what we think. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a thousand questions. Let me just ask a couple and then um, and then I'll let other people jump in. Um, uh, first, if it's okay, I would like to go back to that concept of polarization that you had uh, towards the beginning. It, it, could we just walk through a concrete example to make sure I'm understanding it correctly? Um, so uh, just to think of a very polarizing topic that isn't quite as charged now, Let's say I'm very, uh, what's an example? Let's say I were, I'm completely pro-life and let's say you're completely pro-choice. And so we are at opposite ends of the poles on that. And so as you were describing it, the conversation would be this moment where we still, we still hold those values, but we're also kind of coming together in this, in this beautiful moment where we can recognize and and you were saying um, you didn't say lose each other because that's the wrong way to say it, but um, having more of a of a sense of the other and a sense of how we can coexist and appreciate the other. So can you talk a little bit about that? Just what it looks like in sure, a very sure. practical perspective. Sure. Because it's I love the concept. I just want to think through, you know, what does that look like when you're around somebody and you are the complete sure. opposite. Yeah, great question, Claire, absolutely. And um, so the first uh, thing that we could say is, is someone who is pro-choice actually anti-life? And the answer is not really. And is someone who's pro-life actually anti-choice? And the answer is not really, um, because even if you're in favor of life, you also want to have a choice. Um, and so the question becomes, what does life mean to you? And what does choice mean to you? And now we're still talking kind of somewhat abstractly, but what we really mean is, what does it mean to you? How does this impact your life? Can you tell a story about what it means to you that illustrates you know, kind of why you feel so passionately about this? Or this is a simpler question, why do you feel so passionately about this issue? Um, but what we are doing, this is a kind of mediation technique that is designed to take us to the center of what the problem is. And that's what the pole represents. The pole represents the center. And what is the center? And the answer is what you care about, what you care most deeply about. And so, um, Here's my way of doing it in families. Um, there, here are a couple of options. One, what does the word family mean to you? Um, and you're having a very different conversation than he did this and she did that. What does the word marriage mean to you? What does the word husband mean to you or the word wife or whatever it might happen to be? Here's another one. And in families, I, this, this is a four question process. Question one, what words would you use to describe the kind of family 
you most want to have? Most want to have is a heart-based question. It calls for a heart-based answer. What words would you use? Somebody says, I want a family that's loving. Guess what? That one feels unloved. I want a family that's respectful. That one feels disrespected. I want a family that's honest. That one feels lied to. Which one of those is true? Well, they're all true. Mm -hmm. So we've immediately passed outside of the realm of the single truth. Now, um, question two. Does, do any of you disagree with any of those words? Well, who doesn't want a family that's loving or respectful or honest? Everybody does. And asking this question hundreds of times, nobody has ever disagreed. So I say, congratulations, you've reached consensus. That's the kind of family you want. That's the kind we're gonna go for. Now, question three, are each of you prepared right now in this conversation to begin living up to those words? Are you willing to commit to try to live up to those words right now? And they'll all say yes. Question four, do any of us have permission to stop the conversation if we begin moving away from those words? And they will all say yes. Now we can start to talk. Now, why do you feel unloved, disrespected, lied to? Right? So we've created. Um, that's the poll. We've created the poll by uh, elaborating um, and giving people an opportunity to really uh, flesh out what it is that they mean by each of these things, not in a negative way, but in a way that other people, that is a way that is directed against someone else but in a way that invites others to adopt a similar set of constraints, a similar set of goals. It may not be so important to them, but they can reach consensus on it. And I think it's similar in connection with um, right to life and pro-choice. The truth is um, uh, there, um, uh, it's a difficult, question whether to have an abortion or not. It's complex, it's multifaceted. And among the features, the elements in making that choice are, what's my support system? Uh, what's gonna happen? Uh, is there someone out there who's going to help me? Um, the, are there diseases that this child is going to have that I don't want to have to experience? in my life? Um, are there, uh, you know, uh, 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 problems that, well, I, I won't go into, but you can see what the issues are. The, the, the point of this is, is it possible to create a conversation that is non-digital, that isn't either or? That's what we're looking for. How do, what does it mean to you? How do, well, tell me about you, who you are. And so what we are doing is not just creating categories of questions and response, we are blowing up the categories. Um, Susan Sontag said the only real um, answer that is worth anything is the answer that blows up the question. And these are answers that blow up the question. So in Brooktown, Massachusetts, there was a murder at an abortion clinic many years ago. And what was then known as the Public Conversations Project began, and I was consulting with them at the time that this happened, um, began organizing dialogues between spokespeople for pro-choice and pro-life. Those dialogues continued for about 15 years. Nobody changed their mind, but people began to love each other and care about each other and the violence stopped. Ismail, 
you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. fascinating subject, not to change anything. With respect to the time that we have, would you be kind enough to just briefly uh, expand on that notion that you had brought up before of show me your face before you were born within the context of uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, show me your face before you were born. It's a beautiful yep. Zen uh, question. Uh, the goal of Zen is to get you to be authentic. Um, and the problem is that we have trouble being authentic because we have ideas about who we are, who we're supposed to be. Um, and so the goal of this is to simply point out that whenever you are who you think you're supposed to be, you're not coming from the space of who you actually are. And so there are a series of meditative practices that are designed to reveal to you um, that um, uh, what these layers consist of. Um, and fundamentally what um, uh, you recognize, I have practiced meditation now for many decades and I meditate at least an hour every day. And what you discover in the course of doing this is that, well, here's the question, what is left after you have stopped paying attention to your body you stop having thoughts, you stopped experiencing emotions. What's left? And I think what's left is the moment by moment experience of the flow of life energy within, around, and between you. And it is that moment by moment experience of the flow of life energy that is your ground. And so what we want to help people do is to go to their ground. Um, who are we in conflict? Somebody phony, somebody made up, somebody who's respond, meaning somebody who's a product of our fight or flight reflex. We're just reactive. Um, and in that reactivity, we get actually paradoxically closer to who we actually are. Because when you're angry, really pissed off, you're being a little bit more authentic than when you're pretending. And so one tried and true tactic in every romantic relationship, mostly understood by women, um, is how to poke somebody in a way that makes them more real. You know, just jab them a little bit and get a response because the response is going to be more real. What you want to know, but say if you're dependent, if you're a child and your life depends on this other person is, how are they going to handle it if something goes wrong? You need to know that. But there's a deeper level of reality, um, which is... Um, the, the, if you will, the distinction between the ego and the I. So this is discussed in the third chapter in the book on mindfulness uh, and meditation and spirituality and me meditation mediation. Here's the basic idea. Um, mediation and meditation uh, differ by one letter. Um, and what they both consist of is looking for the middle. But um, how do we get to the middle? And the answer is there are two fundamental ways of creating a middle, of combining things, opposites together to create something that's in the middle. One, take hot water and cold water, add them together and create lukewarm water. Two, take water, add flour and yeast and heat and make bread. I think it's the second that we are trying to do in conflict resolution. We are, of course, are doing the first, which is much, much simpler, um, which is what most litigated case, uh, litigated mediations consist of. You're asking for this, you're asking for that. Let's see if we can figure out some way of meeting in the middle, but to make bread, 
that's a transformation and a transcendence because there's nothing that the bread seems to have in common between water uh, or heat or flour or yeast. It looks different. Make, I hope that's a, a, a helpful response, Ismael. That's beautiful. Thank you so Thank much. You. Very helpful. Thank you. All right, I have one final question. Um, you have you've put so many beautiful ideas out into the world. If you could leave the world <laughs> with one understanding, if there was one key thing that you thought, I just I just want to make sure that everybody really gets this. What do you think that would be? Not to put you on the spot, you know, to sum up your 20 books and everything, but what do you think yeah. would be most powerful? Uh, I, I think it, it, it sounds very, very trite, but I think that it is the deepest truth, um, uh, which is um, with love, there's always a way. And I think that conflict resolution is fundamentally an act of love. And so when I think about neutrality, I think about the opposite of that being um, what I call omnipartiality. Uh, and that's the first chapter is, deals with neutrality and omnipartiality means falling a little bit in love with everybody that you mediate with. Not a lot, just a little bit. So if you're falling in love a lot, that's not good. But what you really want to do is to fall in love with everybody you meet on some level. Why not? This is a miracle, whoever this human being is. Um, absolutely unique in the history of the planet. Out of trillions of possibilities, only one uh, manifests themselves in this way. Um, Thank you. That's what I would say. Hi. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I don't know about all of you. I, I feel like I'm going into the rest of my day now so full of hope, so full of appreciation for everyone that I meet. Um, Ken, I don't know if you'd be willing, but after the book has been out for a few months and we've all had a chance to read it, I know we all have a thousand questions. Like, um, could we do a Truth and Reconciliation Commission yes. over in Israel? Uh, let's talk some more about trauma professionals. There's I know I have a thousand questions already and I haven't even read it. So um, so if you'd be willing, I, I think we all would benefit so much from that. It would be a total pleasure. Uh, I think I sent you a flyer for the book. I don't know if every, anyone received it, but you're welcome to share whatever I sent to you. And um, I will. it will be out hopefully in time for the holidays. We can't so. wait to announce it. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it and make it yours. Oh, absolutely. All right. Okay. Let's all do a huge thank you. A pleasure. A pleasure. Always. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Oh, such an honor. My pleasure. Bye. Thank you.